you would take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter number 4. We'll be looking at verses 1 to 20, talking about the parable of the seed, the parable of the soils, the parable of the sower. Any of them will do. And as you're, um, as you're turning there, I'm, I'm grateful for this music ministry. When we were at the, uh, what was it, the state convention up in Fort Collins back in October, and the worship team started singing that song, The Goodness of God, and I remember texting I know I shouldn't have been texting during worship, sorry, but uh, as I started texting, and I texted Dee, and I'm like, they're singing your song, and she sent me back an emoji, I think that was like the little teary emoji, and I'm like, I didn't mean to do that, <laughs> but um, it, it's wonderful to have a song associated with you like that, isn't that wonderful? It's just, I, it, and it's a, it's a song that has meant a lot to me um, over the years as well. This has just been a, a wonderful day of worship. This is a long passage, and so I'm going to just ask you to stand in heart as I read, okay? So we're going to start in uh, Mark chapter 4, uh, begin verse 1, and go to verse 20. It says this, Again he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and his teaching, he said this, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone and around him with the twelve, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not, know, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path the word is sown. And when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. You may stay seated. <laughs> so Jesus here, as you can see, began to lean into teaching. So whenever you begin to teach the word, there's a lot of different ways that you have to go about understanding your audience and understanding, in, the, in this case, a congregation, which is just more than an audience. It's a group of covenant people that have gathered together to sit under the Word of God and to be able to hear the Word of God. And, and when you do that, there are certain aspects when you're doing that, whether it's in a sermon or especially if you're in a classroom, there's different ways that you teach. Sometimes people learn better in a tactile sense. So that's why sometimes we have you with the blanks. Have you be able to take a pen and write down the words to fill in the blanks? That's a way for you to be able to hear and, and, or be able to learn. And some people learn audially and some people need pictures. There are different ways that Jesus um, ended up teaching in this, but you would think that there would be times when, when, when you would teach that the whole goal is to make sure that you're understood. 
And yet it seems here that when Jesus is employing the parables, a parable means something where you set, literally means to set alongside. So it's a story that's set alongside what the actual teaching is in order for you to be able to understand. And so the word pictures that Jesus uses of everyday life to be able to talk about a transcendent eternal truth that's why Jesus began to speak in parables. But he also noted that when, you, when he would teach, he knew that by teaching this, some, of, some would not understand. That that was the goal. Because you see, for those who were in the kingdom, this was a way to be reinforced with Jesus' teaching. But if you did not understand, because of your unbelief, you did not or would not understand, then parables served as a prophetic warning to show that there is something that is, that is happening, there is something that is going to come up that you need to make sure that you're listening to. See, if you go down to verse 10 of chapter 4, again, he's saying when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. So he's talking to the 12, his disciples, about this, and he is talking and saying that those that are outside the kingdom, um, they won't understand. Those inside the kingdom, he would explain it, and he would understand it, and they would understand it. But he's quoting from Isaiah 6, you, some of your versions you may see where there's a little indentation there. Some of your versions may not have that. But some of your versions have an indentation which shows that there's a quote. And this is a quote from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And if you've been in church world enough, you know that Isaiah 6 is a pivotal passage in the Scriptures. This is when King Uzziah, after ruling for 52 years, dies, and he ends badly. He tried to take up the role of a priest, and so what ended up happening was he ended up getting leprosy and was outside the camp till the end of his life. And they began to wonder, if good King Uzziah can have this happen, what would be of us? And so Isaiah went to the only place that he knew to go. He went to the temple, and it was there that he saw the Lord high and lifted up, train of his robe filling his temple, filling the temple. The, the attendants to the king, the seraphim, were coming along, and they, they were crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And when Isaiah heard it, he said, Woe is me, I'm ruined, I'm undone. I'm coming apart at the seams, as the case may be. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For I have seen the Lord... And the angel comes and takes the coal the, the, from the altar and puts it on his lips because he was going to need those lips. God was going to use those lips of Isaiah. Whom shall I send and who will go for me? And what, is I, what did Isaiah say? Here am I, send me. And then the commission is this. He says, go because you're about to preach to a people that aren't going to listen to one thing that you're going to say. And that's tough for someone who has a passion for something, who has seen the Lord and wants others to see the Lord, to know that you are going to be preaching and people are not going to listen to you. Just like Jeremiah, zero converts. William Carey, the great missionary from Britain, he did not have one convert in eight years. Adoniram Judson going to Burma had, did not have a convert for, the first, for many of the first years of his life, of, of his life in Burma. And so you're preaching. So the pre sometimes preaching is not going to bear fruit like that. Sometimes preaching is going to be a warning. Because the preaching of the Word of God sometimes makes alive, and sometimes the preaching of the Word kills. This is what we're seeing here. And so what is the determining factor? Part of the determining factor is the Spirit of God working. That's the majority of it. But there's also a recognition as that there is a receiver. Whenever there's a communication going on, there is a communicator and one who is receiving the communication. And what Jesus is saying here is that there are four different types of soils that represent the four different types of hearts that are receiving the Word of God. Which one are you? And as Jesus is talking here, I mean, he has this crowd that is around him, and it says that he began to teach, not meaning that this was the only time that he was teaching, but he's getting ready now to get on it and get ready to go teach because every day that goes by is a day closer that he was going to the cross. He was on limited time, and guess what? So are we. So just as Jesus is having the urgency to get the word out, we need to have an urgency to get the word in. You see? And some of you don't have that urgency right now. 
Even some of you that make call yourselves followers of Jesus, it's either because you don't think you need it or you think you've already got it and everybody else needs it. Be careful. I am not, when I preach a sermon, I am preaching to you. I'm not preaching to someone next to you. Now, of course, I'm preaching to them too. That's the you. That's another you I'm preaching to. But sometimes when you're listening, you may be thinking, boy, I hope they hear that. No, 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 no. You need to hear this. I need to hear this. We all need to hear this. There's never going to be a point where we have arrived. And if you're walking around like you've already arrived, you are going to be a miserable person to be around because you're living out something that ain't so. And yes, I said ain't. Where, where's Linda? Oh, she's not in here. I'm safe. Shh. Okay. So anyway, just kidding, Linda. But that's the, but that's the idea is that we've got to make sure that we're receiving the word. So let's, let's look at the first one very quickly. The sower is the one who scatters the seed, which is the word of God. Now, in this passage, who is the sower? Jesus is the sower. Now, you're saying, well, Jesus has been gone a really long time. Well, that's why he has sent preachers and teachers and counselors and Christians He sent Christians to go into the world, to go into your homes, to go into your schools, to go into your jobs, to go wherever you may be as a missionary, but that's why he has sent people like this. Now, when you see this word in verse 3, I must say this before I just scoot on past it. Jesus uses the word listen. Now, the word listen in, in the Greek is a word where it's like, Sound waves hitting your eardrums, and you are hearing things being said or things happening. This is not that word. This word is a word where if you look at it in the Greek, there's a word that we get the word hyper. So it's not just listening where it's hitting the eardrums. It is a hyper listening that goes past the eardrums into the mind and into the heart that leads to obedience. So you could be here hearing the word right now, feeling very satisfied, I have heard the word of God. But what is it leading to? Is it leading to obedience? This is what Jesus is talking about when he is saying, listen, listen. And this is when he says in verse 9, he who has ears to hear. Well, we all have ears to hear. I mean, if our hearing is, is somewhat, I got this ringing in my left ear all the time. I have to sleep with white noise going on to kind of overshadow it. But I can hear what's being said, and hopefully you can hear what's being said. That's why we have amplification. That's why we have a sound system with a sound person, because we want to make sure you are hearing. But there's a difference between hearing and hearing. There's a difference between hearing and hyperhearing. And that's what he's calling us to do. Hearing toward obedience. And that's where every preacher of the word of God feels that. And there's an actual word that's used in the Old Testament, a burden. A burden. Oh, please, we beg our people to hear what is being said so it's going toward obedience. Not just getting educated, but edified, sanctified, moving on again toward obedience. So what are these soils? What are they, what are they talking about? What are we dealing with here? What is Jesus trying to communicate here? Again, I hope you have ears to hear. The second one we, we look at, the second point, but the first soil, it's a hard soil. That's when Satan comes to take it away. So you look here, at verse 4 it says, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path and the birds devoured it. Now, this is an interesting thing because when they were talking about plowing back then, it's basically when someone was, is taking a stick and they just put it in the ground and go this way. Regardless of where it is, put it in the ground, go this way. The, the short amount of time that I lived on a farm, we would plow these rows and make sure that we were systematically putting seeds a certain amount of distance apart from each other, and that's what I thought of. Well, you know, Jesus is talking to those who are living in the first century, not living in the 20th or the 21st century when it comes to this. The ultimate applications for us, don't get me wrong. And so that's why it looks like there's just this haphazard type of scattering, but that's what they would do. There was a seed that with the bag, and they would just start scattering. But the path that's here is a path that is a well-worn path. It's a path that is 
has been so traveled so much from the busyness and the activity of the world that it grows hard. And the seed has nowhere to find its purchase. So that's why, if you go over to verse 15, Jesus explains what this is talking about. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown. And why? Because the seed's just laying right there on the ground. And that's what can happen to us when we are so distracted. The busyness of life causes us not to think about what we need to be doing as far as, well, we don't even think about what we're going to be doing tomorrow or the next week because we're so busy with right now. That's where these phones, you got these phones in your face all the time. They can distract you from the business that you've got to be taking care of around you because we all have those responsibilities. Don't let the distractions put them off. Some of you may have read the book by C.S. Lewis, um, it's called uh, Screw Tape Letters. That's it. Yeah, Screw Tape Letters. And what that is, it's a fictional account of an uncle who is named Screw Tape, who is talking with his nephew, um, uh, um, Wormwood. And what he's doing is your letters, your fictional letters that are going back and forth, but it gives a truth, I think there's some, some residue of truth to it about how Satan tries to get us off track when it comes to eternal things. And so one of the things that he was talking about was that there was a, a man who was reading in the British Museum, and he noticed that the train of thought in the man uh, started going toward what he called spiritual inquiry. And so screw tape intercepted him and made him terribly hungry for lunch. This is how it goes. Once he was in the street, the battle was won. I showed him a newsboy shouting the midday paper and a number 73 bus going past. And before he reached the bottom of the steps, I had got him into an unalterable conviction that whatever odd ideas may come into a man's head when he was shut up alone with his books, a healthy dose of real life by which he meant the bus and the newsboy was enough to show him that that sort of thing just couldn't be true. Satan will do what he can, when he can, to distract you from taking care of the business that is going on. And Lewis wrote this in the 1940s and 1950s, before television before smartphones, before computers. Now we have quick access to everything. Do you, remember, do you remember some of you, you may remember a time when you didn't know something and you had to be okay with not knowing something for a bit? David and I went to a consignment shop and uh, he, he likes finding these, these ships and, you know, the, these pa- prints and paintings of these ships and, you know, we're trying to find out who the painter was and he could pull out his little oracle the phone, and he could just type in and find out everything it was about this obscure painter that paid this, painted this obscure painting. I mean, it's really quite frightening, but we've gotten so used to that. We've gotten used to not needing to not know something. And it gets distractions. So what, what are some of the things that are distracting you with the busyness of life and the busyness of, day, of the day that is keeping you from thinking about eternal things. Remember I said that every day that Jesus preached was one day closer he was going to the cross. Well, every day you live is one day closer to the end of your life. What are you doing about it? What am I doing about it? I'm not going to live forever. D- Daniel asked me the other day, Dad, do you think you'll be alive in 25 years? I don't know. But it was just one of those things where we're all thinking about it. Our, our, my parents are aging. Obviously, his grandparents are aging. And we're starting to think about those things. I'm like, 25 years? That's 75. I don't know. Bob and Norma Pickerel just celebrated their 67th anniversary. I don't know if I'm going to ever be that old, much less be married to someone else for 67. Congratulations, by the way. That is something. That is something. I'm glad the Lord allowed me to work that in there somehow, you know. (laughs) But here's the next one, the rocky soil. The rocky soil. That's where persecution makes it fall away. Persecution. And it's not just persecution because there's times when we think we're being persecuted about something. It's not persecution in in the biblical sense. What it's talking about is being persecuted on account of the word. Let's get back to here. Verse 5. We're going to toggle back and forth. So verse 5, other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. 
And when the sun rose and, and was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Well, we go to verse 16, again, toggling back and forth. And it talks about and gives an explanation, Jesus does. And these are the ones on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. That's good, to, that's good right? Somebody hears the word, they immediately receive it with joy. Wow! But there's more to it. But they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises again on account of the word, they immediately fall away. Persecution is a part of the Christian life. If we are going to live a life in Christ, we will be persecuted. All those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It will happen. Acts 14.22 says that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Which may affect not only how we live our life, but maybe how we view the end times. Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. There's never going to be a time where we're not going to be removed from that as followers of Jesus. Something to think about. But in the, in the time of Jesus, there, is, there was a two to... And, and even now, I would say, I've never, I haven't been to the Middle East. I haven't been to Israel, the Holy Land. But in the time of, of Jesus, the area that he walked around, there was um, often a two to three inch layer of soil over limestone bedrock. And when the sun go in the work, the seed can take hold in the thin soil and make it grow very quickly. But over time, that same sun can wither it because the roots can't take hold in the bedrock. And so that's what we have to realize is that over time we will see where people are. Because we've seen that, haven't we? We've seen it over time that people have just gotten really excited about following Jesus. When I was a youth pastor in the late 90s down in South Florida, um, I'll, I'll make up a name, but there's this guy, Sean, and he was like 13, 14 years old. And his sister was older, part of our youth group. And this little kid, well, 13, he ran forward. He's like, I want to be a Christian. Yes. And anytime the doors were open, whether it was a youth event or not, it could have been something for seniors. He wanted to be there. He had to be at church. But then over time, say two or three months later, well, we're, hey, uh, mom and dad, where's, where's Sean? Oh, yeah, he had a thing, but he'll be there next time. Well, next time came and next time went. He wasn't there. He wasn't there. And after a while, he quit answering our calls. He, I mean, he went from excited to not even, I think the word now is ghosting. Terrible term, by the way. That, that just hit you. Oh, ghosting. But that's what happened. And how does that happen? And what do you do? You begin to think, what did I do? Was there something I said? Was there something I did? Could I have taught him better? Could I have done this? I mean, you start thinking about all of these things because that's what I do. Because whenever something bad happens, I don't think about what somebody else should have done. I start thinking about what I could have done better. And then when I went through the list, there was, some, there was something here that informed me that sometimes that's what happens. It shows up and then Satan comes along and begins to work and begins to move. But you have to realize, dear Christian, especially if you're a new believer, persecution, tribulation is a part of it. When you go through it, that does not mean that there's something wrong. There will be people in Christian world that will tell you that something's wrong, that there's not something wrong. If you are living a life on account of the word, you are going to be persecuted, whether it's by family, whether it's by friends, whether it's by society. You know, you may be your own worst enemy. You may have things happening in you. I don't know. Look to Christ. See where he is. And see what he has done for you. In Matthew 5, verses 10 to 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Again, he's not saying that persecution doesn't come. He's not talking about persecution when you're being a jerk. Because there's people that, in the name of Christ, are just absolute cranks to deal with. Just go on social media. But sometimes just going, going homes. 
Go in schools, go in Christian organizations. Sometimes people believe that they're standing up for Jesus when they're really just being a jerk in Jesus' name. Stop it. See what he has for you. We are to love one another and sacrifice ourselves for one another. Not always believing that we are walking the high road. We have to be very, very careful about that. The fourth one that we look at is now the thorny soil or the cares of the world choke it away. And Jesus comes along here with the thorns in verse 7. He says, other seed fell among the thorns. The, the, <laughs> rewind. Look at that. Play. Other seed fell among the thorns. I'm so excited to get to this point. I just I have to gotta make sure I'm slowing down. Other seed fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it. And it yielded no grain. Well, what's, what's being said here? Well, now we're at the verses 18 and 19. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word. But the cares of the world, three things here, and know what they are. The cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word. It's growing up. Thorns, thistles, choke the word can't grow goes only so far can't grow it withers it dies cares of the world is another piece of distraction and i think when we end up looking at other people that are celebrities and where we admire them we've got to be really careful about that because those celebrities and especially those in christian world where they are celebrities we that's why we're seeing so many of them i think fall is because rather than looking to christ so many of them are looking to the things that are around them and, they're saying, and they like the glitz. They like the admiration. They like people patting them on the back. They like what, what's being presented out there. But what's going on in the heart? What's going on behind the scenes? Because what's going on in private will come out in public. Who you are in private is who you are. That's called your character. And so that's why Jesus is making sure that we are not getting distracted by these three things, by the cares of the world, but by the deceitfulness of riches. Riches, people think if I get enough money, I can retire, I can settle down, I can do what I want. And they think that that's going to, it's actually, if you're not looking at, at it in the right way, it can be more of a snare than it is a blessing. In 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, the love of money, not money, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Verse 17 of that same chapter says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Riches are not evil. Loving riches and loving the acquisition of riches as an idol is where the evil comes in. Because God may have blessed you with a truckload of money. You might be Scrooge McDuck where you can sit in the bathtub and take a bath with a bunch of money. Are you with me? Got that picture? You're welcome. Then, but you, you might have that. But God gives that to you so you can be a blessing to others. Not that just so you can be blessed. What does Psalm 37, 4 say? Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Some of you are delighting in the Lord because you want him to give you the desires of your heart. That's not what it's saying. Our desire is delighting in our delight, Jesus. He's our desire. You're gonna have, everybody else around you is going to let you down one way or another. And you're going to look in the mirror and you're like, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I thought that. And you're going to let yourself down. But Jesus, he won't. Always there, even in the midst of the valley, he's there with us, walking through us. Because if we, if we decide to go these other routes, then the, 
then the word is going to be is going to be choked out. And I think one of the tragic figures in all of the Bible is a man by the name of Demas. Demas was someone where in Colossians four fourteen, Luke the beloved physician greets you as does Demas. So Demas is there with the work that Paul is doing. In Philemon, verses 23 and 24, and you're asking what chapter? Only one chapter, so we just talk verses. Philemon, verses 23 and 24, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Demas was there. But in the last chronological book that we have of the Apostle Paul, which is in 2 Timothy, and the last chapter of the last chronological book that we have of the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, it says, For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. A fellow worker, and he got deserted when he needed them the most. It's a tragic tale. It's a tragic thing that goes on because when you have fellow workers that are around you, that's a joy for any leader. And so when we see this, we are reminded of 1 John 2, 15 to 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. We so want the world to love us and to give us acceptance. That part's dying away, and yet we're not looking to Christ. Look to Christ for acceptance and, and, and love and, and re- to be received. In Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34, it's talking about how people got, get anxious for what they eat or what they drink or what they're going to wear. But each of these things, saying that's not the thing to be anxious over. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Seek first. Before you do anything else, seek first His kingdom. Not that, no, seek first his kingdom. What about, no, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. He will give you everything you need to do everything that he commands. Praise God for that. And this last part is we see the fertile soil where the word is heard and accepted and bears fruit. This is the type of hearing of the word that Jesus talked about at the beginning when he said, listen, hyper hear. Be hyper diligent in how you hear where it leads toward obedience. What is God calling you to do right now that you're saying, I can't do that? He's calling you to be a faithful husband, a faithful wife. I don't know. He's calling you to be a faithful worker, but you may be pocketing stuff or you may be saying something about your boss in the break room. He may be calling you in school, but you, there, there's a temptation to cheat. There's a temptation to, to kind of cut corners on things. And on and on we can go to be able to believe that we can cut corners on so many things that God has co- told us to be all in, diligent, hyper hearing toward obedience. And I'm not talking to your neighbor, I'm talking to you. 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 And we have to make sure that we keep on hearing. That's the idea. Not one time. Well, I heard the word one time. Keep on hearing. Keep on accepting. And keep on bearing fruit. And boy, that right there. Because we've been sold a bag of goods in our evangelical world. All you have to do is walk the aisle. I've got to do it, Cindy. I'm sorry. Walk the aisle and sign the card and pray the prayer and get on the roll. And that's it and that's all. And that's where you think that's... Where's the... Where's the bearing of fruit over the course of a life? What fruit are we supposed to bear? Well, we're supposed to be ones who are daily repenting. I don't need to repent. I'm already there. They need to repent. No, you need to repent every single day. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. We, we seek purity Purity in action, purity in speech, purity in thought. If that's not a conviction, then you may have to ask yourself, what kind of fruit are you bearing? Is it rotten or is it good fruit? 
We need to move away from selfless, selfishness to selflessness, to Christ-likeness. That's why we get into his word to find out what he's all about. You get into his word and say, okay, Lord, what needs to change in me? Again, you haven't arrived. You're not in heaven. This is not heaven. Do we have to say that again? This is not heaven. You have not arrived. So we get into his word so he works in us on the destination, toward the destination on the journey, I should say. But sharing Christ in word and deed, in your homes, in your schools, in your jobs, wherever you may find yourself. Because it was said, not only of Spurgeon, but even of, of, of John, a man named John Bunyan, that if you were to prick him, he would bleed Bible. And the reason that both Spurgeon and Bunyan could say that is because their character in private and in public was the same. What you saw in the home, you saw and you would see in front of everybody. Many of us got, had a chance to get dressed up and come here. But the Lord sees the heart. Man looks on the appearance. God sees the heart. And I'm not talking about your neighbor's heart. I'm talking about your heart. He sees the heart. Where is it? Has the word gotten in you at all? Maybe you might have such a hard soil that you think there's nobody on earth that could plow it up and I would say, you're right. This is a heavenly plow that needs to be taken to the ground because that fallow ground needs to be broken up. And God can do it in Christ. Uh, maybe you are at a, at a point right now where you are on rocky ground. Not a lot of soil. Springs up real quick. But you need to continue to ask God, especially if you're new to this, you need to ask God, I want to be in for the long haul. I'm not sprinting this. This is a marathon into eternity. That's what I want. And maybe you need to ask God for that. Maybe you're feeling that that Initial joy and zeal is waning over time. That's a bad place to be as well. Maybe the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of things are so clouding out the things of the Lord, it's almost choking it. And that's why you're unfruitful, because you're spending your time on the things here rather than spending your time on the things here. Back then, a tenfold crop was a bumper crop. And Jesus is saying 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. In this broken world, it is stunning that God is still moving and working in hearts and minds. Some of you had a background. You may think God may not be able to do anything with you, and yet here God comes in through Christ. Oh, there is hope, yes. He can fix your marriage. He can fix your relationships. He can fix you. If you turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Look to Christ. Don't look to other people. Look to Christ. I'm not talking to your neighbor. I'm talking to you. Look to Christ and see what he would have you to be and know that he will be there with you to take you to where he would have you to be. Don't wait. If you're wondering whether you're a follower of Jesus, don't leave today until you know. If you want to make a commitment to Christ this morning, I'll be standing right here to receive you in the name of Christ so that you can be welcomed in by this body of believers and continue to walk in your, in, in your faith in Christ. But if you just need to come up here and pray, you and God, yeah, you can do it there. Please do. You may need to grab somebody. I need you to come with me. Do that. But come up here and use these steps as an altar of prayer. Don't leave here. Don't leave here without the word of God going in. Accept it so you'll bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. I could go on, but I'm going to pray. Father, guide us in all that we do and say. And I mean that, Lord. We, please guide us. All that we do, all that we say, all that we think, Help us, Lord, to turn from sin and self and turn to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We live in a broken world and we are walking around with broken hearts. But we thank you, Lord, that what Jesus has done, 
as he died on the cross for our sins, and as he rose from the dead to take away the penalty of our sin and to live in us, to take away the power of sin and to give us a hope beyond this life, to rescue us from the presence of sin. Father, I pray that you would make our hearts to have good soil, ready to receive, ready to bear fruit, not worrying about what other things are going on, not worrying about the cares of the world or the desires of riches. Lord, that we are in this for the long haul, all in for the long haul into eternity. Thank you that you've brought us all together to encourage each other to that point. And I pray, Father, that wherever you may take us, whether we're staying here, whether we're moving elsewhere um, in a, to another state, or whether you're taking us to another part of the world, Father, thank you that no matter where we may go geographically, that you'll never leave us spiritually. Thank you for that, that we can walk through even through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't have to fear any evil. Why? Because you are with us with your rod and your staff comforting us. Thank you, Father. And if there's anyone here that has not received Jesus, please, Lord, please help them hyper-hear what your word has said so they would come and receive you, make it public, not be ashamed, knowing that they're fully accepted by you. Thank you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name.